Hello and welcome to Personable, a podcast focused on speaking to the world's best, enabling you to become the best you can be. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Hannah Stutz. Hannah is a graduate from Mississippi State University with a Bachelor in Communications. She is now a Tennessee Titans cheerleader with 26,000 followers on Instagram and over 300,000 on TikTok. I'm incredibly honored to be joined by Hannah today. So Hannah, I wanted to start off by asking you, why and how did you get into dance? Gosh, well, first off, thank you for having me today. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so it's crazy. I've literally been dancing my entire life. So just kind of a backstory. Um, like I said, I'm born and raised from Huntsville, Alabama. I was uh, in preschool at my church at the time. And I, so usually here, if you want to start dance, you start at like around the age of like three, like three, four, five, three is like about the youngest. Cause that's, that's pretty young. And so Anyway, I was in my motor skills class and my motor skills teacher came to my parents one day and they were like, you know, we've had um, one girl pull out. We have an opening in the class. We know she's like a little bit younger, but if it's something that you'd like to put her in, you know, we'd love to have her. And at the time, the studio owner of the studio that I went to actually went to high school and cheered in high school with my dad. And so they were like, you know, if we're going to do this, like we want to put her here. And so they put me in class and they're like, oh, this like won't last long. She'll be here a few months, maybe a year, but that'll be it. Well, like one year turned into like 20 plus years and here we are today still dancing. But yeah, I danced at that studio for over 11 years and I competed with them. And then my seventh going into eighth grade year, my little brother um, also dances as well. And we were just starting to get opportunities that we wanted to grow our training, grow our experiences. We wanted to kind of travel more and do more. And we couldn't really do that at the studio at the time. And so we left, we stopped competing with that studio um, and then trained at other studios in our hometown, as well as we would come up to Nashville where I live now and train. There was a big boys crew here and we wanted my brother to be able to like dance and take from other male teachers and dance with other male dancers. And so we, we did that um, my eighth grade year and then all of high school. And then once we were getting into eighth, ninth grade, um, we started traveling with conventions. And so there's all of these different dance conventions that have the industry's leading choreographers, people who choreograph for artists, music videos, movies, um, award shows, Broadway in New York, like any and everything in between. And so we want a scholarship, like we would attend these conventions and you take class all weekend long. And if you want a scholarship, uh, if you can get a scholarship big enough to uh, even like they cover uh, your weekends and you go and you assist these choreographers. And so it's a great way to network. It's a great way to meet other dancers and other choreographers. And so we started doing that. So we would pack up on either Thursday nights or Friday mornings and we would jet set all across the country, all across the world, like following these conventions, getting as much training as we could. And then at these conventions, um, they would have agents come in and scout for, you know, new talent. And at 15, I signed with my agent. And so my agency has locations in both Los Angeles and New York. And so I'm signed by Coastal. Um, and from there, that's how we started getting auditions. And I was at that point opened up to like the industry world. So I would, you know, leave conventions one weekend and be in L.A doing auditions the next. And so uh, I did that all of high school. I had some pretty insane opportunities that I'm so blessed to experience. You know, I got to dance with Justin Bieber on his Purpose World Tour. I got to dance at the Black Music Honors here in Nashville. So I got to, um, you know, meet all of the Winans and Seven Streeter and um, the Jacksons. And so um, just having those opportunities were so surreal. And then as I was Approaching my junior and senior year, I first thought, I was like, okay, well, like I knew college was always going to be something. It was always a priority in my life. I wanted to go. I wanted to get a college degree, wanted to have that experience. And so I was looking at schools like way on the West Coast. I thought I wanted to move out to California and do college so I could call, still do college and dance. But um, as I was approaching those years, I was actually out in LA with my mom doing a commercial for Disneyland. And we were just kind of driving around and I looked at her and I was like, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to fully like move this far yet. I don't know if, you know, I was kind of like not questioning, but I was like, kind of like wanting to take a step back for a second. 
because I'm also very passionate about sports and I thought maybe I would want to work in sports one day. And so I was just kind of evaluating like where I was at in life because for me, you know, being from Alabama and going to school in the South, you know, the SEC conference is so big here. So they have incredible internships and opportunities at all of the colleges around here. And I was like, well, maybe that's something I want to do. And so I kind of decided, okay, I think I want to go to school closer to home. I'd grown up going to Mississippi State my whole life. And so I was like, yeah, let's just try it. And they um, they had a dance team, but I never really ever considered dancing in college because just coming from the industry world and the industry side of things, like you just didn't really hear people do that because everyone kind of like leaves at 18 and moves to LA and like chases the dream. And so uh, they had just gotten a whole new coaching staff. And I was like, you know what? I'll go to a clinic and then we'll see. So um, went to a clinic my senior year. I was like, okay, I love the coach. I love the cheer coach. I love where the direction the program is heading. So we'll just, we'll try it and see. Like, I'm still kind of in that mindset. Like, oh, I want to work in sports. Like it's going to overlap. I'm going to, you know, I need to be working my way from the bottom up. Like I don't need to be dancing. And so I gave it one year. Well, one year turned to four. And, you know, we also had COVID happen. So uh, it looking at it from freshman year versus senior year, I was allowed to still do my passion and still what I like love to do in college. But I was still um, meeting the people that I needed to networking, you know, building those same connections, those same relationships, just kind of in a different light. Like I was still getting to dance. I was still getting to share my passion with others. And then from there, sorry, I feel like this is a lot. I'm, t I'm telling you my no, whole I'm life. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, to get to where I am today, we'll wrap this up, <laughs> is I was actually, I was pretty sick my junior and senior year. And I just, I needed to see some doctors back home and kind of like get myself situated. And, you know, when graduation was creeping upon me last year, I gotten involved in so many things at school and like dance was uh, such a big commitment that I had kind of like reached the point in my life for the first time that I was like okay do I want to continue doing this or am I just doing this now because everyone's like oh you should do this like you should be great for this you need to try out for this and this and this and I just at the time like wasn't sure and so it was the hardest decision I ever had to do because at nowhere was like in my plans to like go home and just kind of take a step back for a year but I went back home to Huntsville and I worked for a year and just kind of reevaluated life and where I was at and where I was at mentally and physically and emotional with it all. Um, and so when the audition process kind of starts back around in like January and February of this year, I was like, you know what, if I don't do this and if I don't at least try, I'm always going to live with like a what if. And so, yeah, I started preparing again and March and April rolled around and I tried out and then here we are today. Amazing story. I think it's fascinating <laughs> to learn. And thank you so much. Don't feel like you were dragging on. I think myself <laughs> and everyone listening thoroughly enjoyed hearing that story from from where you are, where you were just, you know, a few years old to where you are today. I think it's an incredible story. Um, I think what's so fascinating for me is, you know, coming from the UK where dance isn't as big of a thing, you know, cheerleading is not as big of a thing, but even someone, you know, in America that doesn't know as much about it is you're making incredibly important decisions at a young age, because if you don't know the dance or know how to do this or don't progress and get better at a young age or get seen by the right people, you're not going to progress into your teens, which means you're not going to progress until college, which means you're definitely not going to become a cheerleader in an NFL team. And so I am 20 years old. I'm a sophomore in college and I don't even know what I want to do yet. And I'm sure your brother is probably similarly has an idea, but doesn't really know even what he wants to study yet, let alone wants to do yet. So is there anything you would have done differently talking to your five-year-old self or your six-year-old self or whenever it was when you started to get into dance? Is there anything you would have said to a younger Hannah? Um, do you think you might have made the right decision to go into dance or would you tell her something else? Yeah, I love that. That question's awesome because that, that is something that I kind of like sit and resonate with sometimes because it's, it's funny. We will sit and have family discussions and we're like, you know, if we could go back and do it again, like, would we do it the same? Like, would you guys want a different lifestyle? Because I, I will say, um, just going to be 100% like transparent. Once we kind of jump on this dance train, it is so fast paced. It is every single weekend. It's go, go, go that you kind of wake up one day and you're, you know, 23. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, 
what, where am I at in life? Like, what am I doing? I've danced my whole entire life. So if I could go back, yes, I would 100% do it the way that I did because I am so blessed for the people that I've crossed paths, paths with, the connections I've made, the experiences I've had. Um, all that to say, did I miss out on a lot of stuff? Yes, but it, was it something that I ever regretted? No, you know, in especially those middle and high school years, you know, you're going, starting to go through puberty and life changes a lot and it's in a very emotional part of your life. And so for me, I did like miss out on a lot of things, a lot of like, I guess what you could say bonding experiences, but the friendships and the relationships I made um, traveling on the road are ones that mean like so much to me and it's it's crazy i've built relationships that you know we might not necessarily talk on the day to day we might talk once a month or once every other month or heck six months go by or a year goes by or you know and like we pick up exactly where we left off and i am so um blessed that i had parents that were so invested in both me and my brother and woke up every day and wanted to provide us with all of the materials to be successful. They wanted to show us, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the industry, just that way that when we were 18 and we did have that freedom to go and move out there or go to college or decide like where we wanted to go in life, they wanted us to have all of the tools. They wanted us to make sure that we were 100% like on board. This is what we wanted to do. And so I really am truly blessed and I would go back and tell my younger self like, Yes, it's not always going to be easy and it's going to be hard and you might miss out on things, but the small things I missed out on are nothing what I got to experience. And for that, like, I truly am like thankful for everything that has happened up until this point. Why do you think your parents were so invested in wanting to make this a sort of career and train both you and your brother in this industry? Yeah, so um, my parents were a little bit, well, they had known each other for a long time, but when they got married, they were a little bit older. And so for them, again, they were very blessed. They had, what they always told us is, you know, we have lived our lives. Like we got to experience like our college years and, you know, we experienced our 20s and made the most of it. And they worked so incredibly hard that they were, they were blessed to have, you know, the means to provide us the all of the training that we need, all of, you know, the freedom to like get in the car and like drive, like, you know, having a 24 to 48 hours notice before an audition was happening or jumping on a plane or, you know, taking us out of school or doing whatever they needed to. And so they always, whenever an audition would come or a convention weekend would come, they were like, no, we want to do this for you guys. Like we've lived our lives. Like y'all are our priority now. Like we are so blessed to have you guys and we want you to be successful and experience life the way that we have. So we want to be able to provide you with everything that we can to just help you, you know, you know how we in it, like it didn't even have to be dance. Like if we wanted to quit dance, then they were like, wanted to pick up, you know, I saw that you play like rugby or swimming or like <laughs> we ran track and yeah. played softball or, or whether it was, you know, like drama club or math like what whatever it was they were like we just want you to work hard like be successful and just love what you do and so for that like we are so incredibly blessed and i could not speak i i just there's not enough words in the world to say how thankful i am for them i love i love that you mentioned rugby because that's that's my family's favorite sport <laughs> um like my siblings and cousins all that's that's our area of interest so i thought that was fascinating um, but being so young, and you mentioned when you're going through pu puberty and like growing up, I feel like teenage boys, teenage girls, and just teenagers in general, there's a lot of like echo chambers about people aren't always the nicest people, you know, talk, talk shit about each other, to be honest. And while you are doing the most incredible things, you're performing in front of, you know, with people like Justin Bieber, and you know, you're performing with TV networks and whatnot. How did you both keep yourself humble? but also motivated because I'm sure it would have been pretty draining, you know, doing all of that as well as doing school on the side. Yeah, no, it was a hundred percent. It was. And, you know, um, I think being in the industry that we are, it's like really molded us, you know, early on, we had to learn a lot of hard lessons and, you know, it's not like you go into these auditions and you're 11, 12, 13, 14, like you're a baby or you're in your, you know, early teen years. You're just like, you know, you're insecure, you start having acne. And like, for me, you know, 
sharing the same passion like with my brother like he's a boy i'm a girl and he's got this like bright blonde curly hair and he's got a look to him and you know there is for like what every one boy that's a dancer there's like a thousand girls that are a dancer so obviously when you find a male dancer you're like oh my gosh this is amazing um <laughs> But, you know, it's not. And for me, like I, I always looked a lot older than my age. So when I was 15, like I was 15 looking like I could be 18. But, you know, when you're trying to cast for like an early teenager, like on a show, like I just automatically looked older. So, you know, when you walk into those auditions, it's not necessarily about the dan the best dancer in the room. Like they're looking to feel a, a fill a certain role and uh and the moment, like, that's hard. Like, that's a hard pill to swallow. You start to question, you know, why am I not good enough? Like, why don't I look this way? Why don't I dance that way? Like, why couldn't they have picked me? Like, what am I doing wrong? And in the moment, like, that is hard. That's hard to experience at such a young age. But I think, like, it does. It You grow a backbone, for sure. Um, you mature very fast. Um, you're, you know, you're experiencing a, a lot of things that most, like, middle school and high schoolers don't exist until later on in life or if, if they even experience it sometimes they never do and so that's the that's like the hard part of the industry where it's like you know you ask like if you could go back again what would you tell yourself just to you know tie back to that and I would if I could go back I would not tell myself to not get so tore up about things because like it wasn't who I was as a person at the end of the day or like you know my talents and like my background and my training I just like it, it was literally out of my control. It, they were looking for something certain and I just like didn't meet those, you know, requirements that day. But like every no gets you closer to a yes or closer to booking that job or booking that tour or, you know, making that team. And so that was like the hard parts, but it does grow you as a person. How do you deal with that sort of environment? Because thinking about, you know, getting rejected from school or from a college, not getting a bad grade, not making a sports team, not making a, you know, a band or an orchestra or something. It's very much a case of, I tried out for this thing. I wasn't good enough at this point in time, but if I go away and I work on said thing, hopefully I'll have the chance to try again and get in. Where with cheerleading from an outside perspective, it can sometimes be a case of, sure, you might be the best dancer in the world, but with all the roles you're talking about, if you don't look the part, you can't get it. So I was wondering if you could describe to me a bit more about like, some strategies or ways you've been able to evolve your thinking to deal with that. And then also for young boys or girls, both trying to get in the industry or just, you know, dealing with life as it is and, you know, in the world we live in today, how they can go about dealing with it themselves. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's hard, like it's hard and it takes, you have to, it takes a lot of maturity to be able to sit yourself down and look at yourself in the mirror and be like, like you know what? I am enough. Like, I was created to be me, like what my unique quirks and things like that's who makes me who I am. And if like, you know, that, I guess like, oh gosh, how can I say this? Um, I guess like what I've had to learn and I want to like tie school into this. I'm so happy that I went to school and like got a degree and got an education because what has helped me recently is, you know, it's hard because you get so in the dance world or so in the cheer world and it's like so like it's you know it, it it's time consuming and it's a lot and it's like a very like i hate to say cutthroat but it's like a very intense industry is i'm like you know what if i didn't book this or i didn't make this team or i didn't look this way like i have a brain in my head and like i have other passions and other things that makes me who Hannah Stutz is and embracing those and embracing like just everything outside of my dance life and i like i will say that this last year like when i went home and like took a step back and even like towards the ends of my senior year and i think not just for dancers i think a lot of people struggle with this in college too because like college is like such a high point in your life and you know you've moved away from home and you're living on your own and you're experiencing so many new things and you are it's like the first time in your life that you're really in control of every single decision you make. And I had allowed myself and my identity to be, oh, I'm Hannah Stutz, like I, like I'm on the, I'm the girl on the dance team, or like I'm like I dance, 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 dance. And at the end of the day, it's like, while that has yes made so much of who I am, that's not all of me. And like I can 
bring more to the table and bring more to the discussions and the conversations and like share more about life than just dance. And that, that takes time. That takes maturity. That takes a lot of, you know, hard experiences of not getting things. And it's, it's, you know, it's evolves over time. And I hope I kind of like answer that question. I know I'm kind of like venturing down a path, but that's of course what I've had to just like set yourself down and, and tell yourself like that. It's not everything at the end of the day too. Many of like my ways of thinking about cheerleading, as as I said, from an outside perspective, having come overseas from the UK, like I didn't really know much about it. And I kind of thought it was, you know, my bias was towards it's just people that are very attractive and, you know, they don't have all these talents on the outside. Um, but because I'd never really just critically thought about it and it wasn't as intertwined with my culture as it is intertwined with the state culture and the, the national culture in the US. Um, but I actually watched um, America's Sweethearts, uh, Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders uh, this yeah. summer, and yeah. I absolutely loved it. Like every, I watched all of it. Um, I talked about it a lot with my family, and I think it gave me a really good insight into how rigorous the whole process is, and being able to get the, you know, the personal attachment to the cheerleaders that are going through it, and the vets who are coming back and not getting in the team, and you know what it takes to really be one of the world's best. I was wondering if you could like you know, talk to me a bit about that because you've now been through the process yourself on like what it takes and like just adding some context into, you know, actually going through those stages from more the recruiting process of of becoming a cheerleader and how, you know, close that is to what it looked like in the Netflix documentary. Yes, I am so happy, A, that you won watch this, but I'm (laughs) so happy that you bring this up because this is like my favorite thing to talk about because that that is something so many people that I meet when they find out like, oh, you're a professional cheerleader, cheer in the NFL, like, is it is Dallas Cowboys exactly like what it says it is? So yes, for the majority of it is yes. Um, it's it's very rigorous. It's um, very hard on your body. And I kind of want to talk about this first, because if it, for anyone that is looking to do this, and has like these concerns, I every every single one of us has fallen guilty to it. Obviously, um it's talked about but it's not talked about it's kind of just like the expectation is set just because you can you know as you said like you know the the role of being like a cheerleader or a professional cheerleader is a bunch of like you know beautiful girls and you can see the outfits that you wear um and uh you know body image is a huge conversation in the dance and cheer world and embracing like who you are and like just your body as a whole and so I that sometimes can you know there's such a negative light brought to it because like just like in the past girls are so hard on themselves and they go to insane lengths to like have what they would call like the perfect body and um I I just want to speak like so highly of the team that I'm currently on because it has been the most like positive encouraging um experience and atmosphere so far um i I will say like the dance and cheer world it can be a very toxic place sometimes it's very very competitive it goes back to that you know it's a bunch of beautiful talented girls that have trained their entire lives to get to this point and they only have you know for example like for dallas cowboys they only have 36 spots like they have that perfect pyramid and that's all that they have to offer and girls train their whole lives for it and when you know say they don't make the team they they think their world is over and um by no means is that true um but i am for me i have been so blessed to be on a team that is you know we our director when we were going through tryouts she said you know I love the atmosphere of like, I think a lot of professional teams have like a sisterhood atmosphere, like a lot, like one, like you would find like in, you know, like say a sorority type setting or like a a, a big group of girls and like you bond over like late night practices or like you're getting yelled at because it's the routine's not clean enough. And so you create that sisterhood. But for my team, you know, my team is a little bit different than say like a Dallas Cowboys because we actually have 
we actually have stunt like stuntmen so we have like co-ed cheerleaders like flyers and stuntmen and so like that kind of brings even a whole different like atmosphere to our team so we have 18 like quote unquote like cheerleaders but like we're we grew up with a dance background and then the rest is we have tumblers and stuntmen and flyers and they did more of like actual like co-ed and all-girl cheer um in college or you know previous before um before the nfl and so having that kind of experience has been very different and i so just lost my train of thought of where i was going to that but you were asking about the process um yeah so i know in the past like dallas has touched a lot on like leading up to making the team and so every every team is different um i when you go to try out for a team really it's like going to pick like what college you want to go to you know obviously you want to have to love or want to live in the city that the team is in um, whether that be the different you know weather climates or you know east coast west coast north south you have to want to live there obviously um and then you know every team has a different style to them you have to look at like what they wear some teams dance in boots some teams dance in tennis shoes like some teams are geared towards like hip-hop and like hardcore and some teams are more jazzy and palm some teams are more just like even like appearance based it's just kind of like what you're looking for what you feel like best suits you and then um covid has obviously changed changed the game and as far as tryouts but every team's tryouts are a little bit different um i'll talk a lot about mine so we have our tryouts more in like end of march beginning of april so our tryouts are more on like the earlier side of things um and you do video submissions you submit like resumes you submit other choreography that you've done um and then from there we come to like a finalist round an in-person finalist round and ours it's like usually a week long and that's where you have in-person practices with like the vets that have to try out again and then the other new people that have advanced on to finals and then for us like after a week long of practices we had a in-person like live audition they built a stage they had lights we had finalist uniforms we performed you know all of the choreography that we had learned up until that point and then we had improv rounds and we had on stage questions just asking about you know so they can get a better idea of like who we are as a people we had interviews with the directors um we got to share just like our background like what we're passionate about like you know they're very they're the organization that i'm with is like very supportive of like yes, like you're a cheerleader, but you're also a person outside of this too. And we want to like encourage you and uplift you. And like, um, this is not like that sisterhood I was saying, this is like a job, you know, we're paid to do this. And yes, we treat each other as a family would, but at the end of the day, we're coworkers. Um, there's no I in team. Um, if someone's like having a bad day, like they come in and they lift you up. Like it makes me emotional talking about it because like it has been, like for the dance and cheer world to be like so toxic and hard and intense at times it's like so rewarding to like i wake up every day and like i'm sitting here now and like i have practice tonight and we always start practices with highs and lows and like i can't wait to go and be in, like be like what well, on the podcast today like you guys have to go check harvey out he's awesome like i wake up every day like let's go to practice like let's go to appearances um and sorry i this is dragging out but Yes. Stop saying that. I'm loving your story. It's a great story. <laughs> um, what you see is like a lot, you know, like, yes, I will say, you know, you're smart. You get it. Um, at the end of the day, too, it is a Netflix show. And so that is, you know, reality TV. And I think some things are probably a little bit more over dramatized than like what actually does go on. But it is intense and it is hardcore. And girls and guys train their entire lives for this moment and it's not always easy and you saw um they you know people's families are involved um it just anyway it's um yeah so <laughs> I, I i don't like this question because um i think a lot of the negatives of the cheerleading world from my perspective are based on outward appearances what you look like what you sound like how you dress but i still feel like it is some, such a fundamental part 
And I think you've kind of touched on it there in terms of like the highs and lows of the team, you know, maintaining your individuality. But in a world in which you're always expected to look a certain way, to sound a certain way, to follow someone else's dance, it's not like a sport where you can like change the move if you want to. You have to, being good at it means you have to follow the moves of the choreographer. How do you maintain your sense of self um, in this landscape? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question because um, a lot of, you know, a lot of teams or groups or whatnot build a mold and they want you to fit this certain mold. And so, you know, you're changing your hair color, you're, you know, doing like these intense, like rigorous, like workouts to like look a certain way. And, um, you know, not like while there is that in some areas, not every team is like this and not every experience is like this. Just kind of touching back on my team, you know, uh, they all that they ask is that like they love us for who we are and they um, want us to like be our, our our authentic selves when we come to tryouts. And so like our only rule is like, you know, we just ask that like what they ask, like what we look like at tryouts is like what we look like throughout the year. And that's just nothing bad. Like, you know, they just don't want us to start the season off with like blonde hair and then me like dye my hair like black, like midway mid season. And it, that's just for like, you know, being, we'll just, we won't talk about like, it's a little bit different as far as like the industry world, because that's, you're more of an individual as who you are, but like speak on the terms of being on a team, you know, just as, and this is like mind blowing to me. Cause it's like, I, I it's hard to wrap around like, Oh, like, people do know who I am or like people like see me like every weekend when they come to games. And I'm just thinking, you know, they're coming to watch like the football players or like the basketball players, like if say if you're an NBA cheerleader, NBA dancer, but like, no, like it is true. They like fans follow you just like they follow the team. Um, they have, they make posters. Like I, it's crazy. Like my first appearance that I did this year is like, you know, I was like signing autographs and I'm like, <laughs> I don't mean like I don't need to be signing autographs, but you know they they it's by no means like our images they they want no negative light they just want um healthy human beings that bring life and bring love to like the organization and the community and they just want um amazing representations like of the organization and of the NFL and so um that that's like that's why I love the team that I'm on right now is because I have never felt like I didn't look a certain way or I didn't dance a certain way that they wanted to, you know, obviously like at every practice, yes, we have to look uniform. We have to look as one. They want us to look clean and have energy, but they allow us to add each of our own like individualistic styles, like to our sidelines and to our routines, because like, that's why they picked us. You know, there's not one perfect NFL cheerleader, or NBA dancer, you know, we're made up of 28 incredible individuals that have made like our team to what it is. So for that, I love to use, you know, a question, like you said, it can bring negative light to that world, but having such a positive experience to be like, look, it might look this way, but this is actually how it is. Like, you know. Why do you think cheerleading is such a cultural phenomenon in the US? Gosh, I mean, I think just because you, know, you look back at the people that have come before you and like the legacy that they've set, not even just in like, you know, the cheer and the dance world, like professionally, but if you even look at it, like in movies or, you know, you look at singers and songwriters and like, just looking at the level of expertise that's been set in the past, you know, you just like grow up to like strive to be those people one day, and, you know, like speaking on Dallas Cowboys, like they are America's sweetheart. They play for, you know, the Cowboys, it's America's team. And so that's been get going on for generations upon generations. And you see teams evolve over time and you strive to be that. And so it becomes like, like you said, it becomes a crazy thing. And it becomes like something that you eat, sleep and breathe that. And like, you want to be part of that. Like you want to uh, like have those experiences and love to say like get to say like I was on a team like that like I did dance uh for the NFL or the NBA or like I danced on tour with like a Justin Bieber or so I just is like it go it starts way 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 before our time just 
you know, what's crazy is for how talented people were even, you know, back in the day, the the talent has evolved so much. Like, dancers are become like the the talent just starts younger and younger and younger and people are more flexible and can jump higher and, and can dance bigger and dance longer and it's just like you know, it just becomes like you it you eat it becomes your world. What misconceptions do you think people have about cheerleading? Um, I think I, I'll touch back on to college in this because I, in post-grad, have tried to be an advocate and a, and a voice like in this area. And I won't touch too much on this because I, it's still something that is so new and it's so new to sports in general, but especially like dance and cheer you know it's slowly it's we're a little bit farther behind than like i think what you would call like a normal sport would but um you know nil nil is a hot topic in college sports right now and um i to touch on that i tried to be a voice in college and like i said post grad for like allowing cheerleaders and dancers to get the same advantages and the same opportunities that other sports do you know you had brought this up earlier it's really easy because i think people just get the image and the idea of oh it's a bunch of like pretty people that like stand on the sideline or like stand on the court and they shake pretty pom-poms and they smile and no matter what's going on at the game they just like will take pictures with fans but i don't think people realize that you know in college i got up my day started at 4 45 because our pra we practice in the mornings we practice from 5 30 to 7 45 you know we um had to do our own um like workout routines so like we would work out in practice before we'd start cleaning our routines we ran a mile before a times mile as a team before practice every single day and then we would have a guided workout and so when people are pulling up to their 8 a.m's like i've already been up for three hours and for at my college we danced football basketball baseball so that's a year-round sport um you know our our big crossover months are, are, you know, October, you know, countdown to crazy just happened. So like you're doing football games on the weekend and then you're doing two to three basketball games uh, during the week because you have men's and women's. And so you have to dance both. And so you're our basketball facility, like it's called Cameron at Duke. We had the hump. So I would, I would be up at, you know, 445 and I'd get up, I'd go to practice, I'd go to class. I'd have to rush back and I'd get ready and I have a basketball game. All right, say if it's on like, say ESPN's airing it. Okay, well, that's eight, eight o'clock tip off. Basketball games are usually two hours. So I'd get done at 10. That means I'd be getting home at 1030. You know, you still got to eat. You still have to like nourish your body. You have to recover. You got homework. And then guess what? By the time you do that, you're getting very few hours of sleep. You get up, you go to practice again. Then you get to the end of the week and then you've got football. Well, football takes up a whole day because it's just, you know, in a, it's on a bigger stage. It, it's a longer process. You've got, you know, for us, we had dog walk. We had, um, you know, pep rallies before. And, you know, and then, so that was like our heavy season was the crossover between football and basketball. Well, then you jump to February. Well, then baseball starts. So you're doing still, you're about entering almost March Madness at that point. So basketball, you're playing your big conference games. Um, you're doing big routines there. You have big crowds. You're trying to get it hype. There's close games. Well, then baseball starting. And baseball is heck, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know, it's every day of the week. And so I don't, so a lot of people, because they don't know dance and cheer that much, just think that it's like, oh, like it's nothing for them. And, you know, you also got to realize for us too is, you know, the passionate sports fan that I am. I, I will sometimes get in trouble for watching the game and whatnot. And, you know, we're taught, like, we can't let the highs and the emotions of the game, like, we can't partake because, like, you know, that's a misrepresentation of, like, our job is to get the fans hyped, to get the team hyped. When you're down by two, down by three, and there's, like, you know, 20 seconds left in a game, like, it's our job to be, like, you know, we still have to smile at the end of the day and we can't, you know, we can't boo the other team or we can't react to fan when like fans are hackling you. And so there's so much more that like goes into cheer and dance than people realize. So I've tried to use my platform 
obviously in a positive way. And I just would, I just want to educate people and be like, hey, listen, like, you know, yes, like we are, our youth are, whoa, whoa, here I am stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> our uniforms, like they, just because they have rhinestones and we might hold sparkly pom-poms, like a lot more goes into it. And so when I would talk to my other friends that played other sports, they were just like, that's crazy. That's crazy. Like we had no idea. And I'm like, I know. And we don't really talk about it, but it is a full blown sport. And the, um, the damage that is done to our bodies over time is a lot. Like, you know, so many people have to have hip surgeries and knee surgery and they've got back problems or neck problems because, you know, the intense training that you do day in and day out to get to this point, um, it, your body wears and tears over time. And so I think that we just have to do it in like a pretty light. People kind of don't realize how rigorous it can be. Sorry, I'm really passionate about it. <laughs> no, of course, of course. Um, you actually touched upon that. Um, something I think, as you, I agree with you, being a hot topic at the moment is the idea of NIL. And I think a series, I haven't actually watched it yet, but there's a new series, I think, on Amazon talking about NIL and giving us a closer perspective on what the athlete, what, it, what's, what it's looking like for athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a very famous influencer these days called Livy Dunn, uh, who's yes. a gymnast, gymnast at LSU, I think. Um, and it was basically talking about, uh, my dad watched it, so he told me this. So but it was basically talking about uh, how like someone like her, who isn't the, actually the, the star of the team in real life, but is getting tens of millions of followers and views online, and then is getting millions and millions and millions in NIL money. She's actually now declaring for an extra year and going back to college in order to earn more money instead of becoming a professional. And so we've got this like backwards landscape in which you used to be athlete, make no money, become a professional, make loads of money, where it's actually for a lot of these athletes that won't make any money in the real, in the real world, they are now earning money at college. What right. do you think about the NIL landscape from where it had been to where it is now to where you think it's going to go in the future? Oh, so I, it's, it's crazy to think, it's crazy to think that a 17 year old, 17, 18 year old is making the money that they can today. And that it's like you said, almost done a role reversal because the new pro has become the new college. And from, from, I, I understand it from like the NCAA's point of view, I understand like for legal reasons that if if this is gonna happen, you know, because there is history of the past, like, you know, paying athletes, it they just, you know, did it the wrong way. And so I understand how the NIL has been created to do it the right way and to have rules. I think it is insane how much college athletes can make, um, but I, I, I I understand it and I understand it's like like you said the world we live in and like what life has come to and the future I do think that at some point there might have to be a cap you know I think they're with time the more that they learn about this and you know sign more you know the more that I think as time evolves I think they will have to like make some guidelines or some rules because I feel like there's it's just kind of like not a free-for-all but it's just like a big thing but there's like they're gonna have to like bring it center it more because you know there's there's true freshmen making three times what someone in the pros makes that like maybe doesn't get a, a lot of playing time and so i'm really indifferent about it i think there's a lot more to learn i'm not gonna necessarily say like whether i agree or disagree with it because like it just it has become like what life is now i think we could reel it in just a little bit because it's kind of like you know when you make so much in college like at that point like what do you look forward to I think like the beauty of like college is like you're a baby like you have so much of life to experience and like yes like you're mature and you're at the age that you can make your own decisions like you still got life to learn like you're still gonna like you know do dumb stuff that like a, a college kid would do um and I think it's like the part of like you know you should enjoy college for what it is like you should enjoy having to eat some ramen noodles every once in a while or like you know making a late night cookout run or like you know right like if some you know trying to get that that's just like the cultural part of college that like those are the the good memories you make and i think that like the nil has taken a, away 
a lot of like the drive to make it in the pros and the drive to like work hard and train hard and like feel like and experience the success once you make it to the pros because they've I mean they've made it at such a young age that's just like how I view it um and like I said I I'm the, I think there's a lot of pros but there's also a lot of cons too so yeah, I, I think I would definitely agree with that view. I, I, initially, I was saying, I was thinking in my head, um, like when you were saying we could have a cap to the amount of money they can earn, that they could send it to me and you. I think that would help fix the problem. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so I, that's a solution if the uh, NCAA want to want to go on that. They can send us the money and we'll make sure everyone's paid fairly and there won't be any problems with that. Um, but yeah, and it, it is just crazy. Uh, I, I, I hadn't even thought about that point about when you're in college, just enjoy being a college kid. Because if, you know, the minute you start accepting money, it's not just, oh, cool, this kid's getting paid. No, it's no. You've now got a load of responsibility. If you do anything, you lose all of those sponsorships, which isn't it isn't like a case of, oh, you lost your sponsorships in college, so you can now get them in the real world. It's no, you've screwed that up for life. That's how it is, you know, with the world of social media. Once you do something wrong, you know, it's game over. And you're expected to be this role model at 18, 19, not even playing in a sport, you know, for, for the rest of the world. So it's just this, this crazy environment. Um, on the, on the idea of social media, um, you built up your own social media following. Um, I wanted to delve a bit, bit deeper into that space and like ask you in your, your own career mind and business mind, if you're doing it for fun or for business and how that factors in to your idea of, of your career, whether in dance or beyond that and what your sort of thinking is um, with regards to social media. Yeah. So, um, this is this is so funny. So I have to give Peyton, my brother, some credit because before TikTok, you know, it was Musical.ly and he loved Musical.ly and I just was never really that into it. Like I loved Instagram. I loved, you know, Facebook or Twitter and whatnot, but I just was never really big on the Musical.ly train. And then when Musical.ly, you know, switched to TikTok right before COVID hit again, he was like jumped on the train and he'd been telling me about it. And <laughs> it's so funny looking back now to like kind of see where I've gotten. It's like, this is so funny because I was a big like hater at first. I was like, I'm never going to do TikTok. Like, that's not my thing. Like, I just, I don't understand it. Like short, you know, short clip videos going viral, like doing weird trends. Like, no, not my thing. No, thanks. Um, and so my first TikTok I ever made, it was November of 2019. I, uh, so you know, the big rivalry game in Duke is like Duke UNC. So the big rivalry game in Mississippi for us is Ole Miss Mississippi State. And so it's called the Egg Bowl. It's played on Thanksgiving, big deal. Like everyone eats their Thanksgiving meal, like in the junction, in a tailgate, take it very seriously. So I remember I was, I had gotten ready for, um, for a game and Pate's just like, just make a TikTok, make a TikTok. Like I just make one. And I was like, no, no, no. And I was like, whatever. Like at this point, TikTok dances were like becoming a big thing. And I was like, whatever, like, I'll just post one. I just created an account, like nothing will happen. Well, my first video just made it on the for you page. And he was so mad because he was like, well, of course, like I've been doing this for months. And the first one you do put goes on the for you page. And like, and at that point, you know, TikTok was still really fall small. So I think I got like maybe a thousand views, but like in the TikTok world, that was huge. And so I was like, well, I don't know. So like I'd made like maybe two more before Christmas and I was like, eh, you know, I was in college. Like I was busy. I didn't have time to do stuff like that, whatever. Well, then when COVID hit in like March of that year and we were all shut down there, that's like when TikTok just blew up. And that's when I really started to like gain my following. And for me, I started out literally just making TikTok dances. And I think I will say what helped me is yes, like I was on a college dance team. So that like did separate me from just like, you know, anyone else. And so I would just do TikTok trends and whatnot. And so did that from like March to August. So when I got back to school, you know, I had built, you know, I had a couple, a couple thousand, like we won't, we'll say like five or 6,000, I don't know. Um, and so I continued that on in college. Cause like, while we were still there, like we were still on lockdown, and, like we were still very limited on what we could and couldn't do. So at this, like, you know, this is like all people did was like search on their, you know, be on their phones. And so I continued to make those through my sophomore year. And then from that, like, 
at this time, which this also kind of ties in to like NIL stuff and like social media, which I'll get to in a second, I started, you know, I would do like TikTok trends like in my uniform. Well, that separated me even more because like I could sit here and talk about being a professional or like a college trailer all day, but like seeing me in my uniform, well, that separates you from a whole nother level of people. And like that makes you in unique and different in your own way. So I started making the videos like every time I had a game, I would just get ready early and like make, make a couple TikToks and then they would go viral. So I built a lot of my platform from in college. And then with time, I, I did like I, you know, this is when, you know, NIL was really starting to like get talked about and start coming to like certain schools, like middle of my junior year. And like it was just getting to Mississippi State, like my senior year and like really it kind of evolved once I graduated so like really within the last year and a half um but I was starting to get a lot of like opportunities with like Red King and with like part like varsity is a um is a brand that does a lot of like cheer uniforms dance team uniforms they do a lot with college teams and high school teams all over the world and so um I started getting stuff like that because they would you know they'd be like oh like could you talk about using this on a game day, um, like Murad skincare, like I've, you know, done, done lots of things like that. And so that's kind of like where it started for me. And so, um, I, so to answer your question, yes, I would, you know, kind of like NIL, you can make so much off of social media. Um, now, is it a very oversaturated, like, place now yes because people are realizing how much you can pay and so there's so many creators so now you're in this like competitive mindset of like okay what kind of content can I make that makes me me and I can share who I am as a person but like separates me from like all a hundred other million cheerleaders or dancers like you know that can do TikTok things and whatnot and so I would love like yes I would love to like make social media full-time thing um and I will say looking back and looking at someone like Olivia Dunn, I didn't know, I didn't have the knowledge on social media and how much I could profit from it until after college. And if I could go back, I don't necessarily regret it, but if I could do something different, I wish I would have taken the social media thing a lot more seriously. I wish I knew then what I knew now, because I feel like my, I would have produced better content. Um, and more like educational content and doing more of like a day in my life as like a college student that dances on a, you know, on a dance team or share my experiences like in the classroom. And I did, I um, had some internships in college where I was able to like share light and like um, educate people like on this, is, like on the university as a whole. Like I worked a lot with like public affairs. So that worked with perspective and transfer students. And I got to, create these videos like we had a whole um, social media team and we would go around and highlight the cool things that Mississippi State to offer that to say um, say someone like you coming from overseas like that has no idea like you can't just like up and drive to Mississippi State one day and take a tour like how can we yeah. create videos that can educate like people worldwide that might want to come to this university that are passionate about you know like we had an, an incredible engineering program and a vet school and meteorology and uh, agriculture. Like, how can we highlight, you know, um, all of the unique things that we have that can draw students to like want to come to Mississippi State? So I had that opportunity um, to do those. But yes, if I could go back, I definitely would do a better job and like, you know, I would just make a quick video and post it. But, you know, it, it's a whole process. Like it, it takes time and you have to wake up and you have to you know, plan your, like, it is a full-time job. And so that is something that I would, yes, I would like to continue. Um, but, you know, now that NIL is a thing and um, you have to be so careful and I, to tie the professional world into this, every team has different rules. Every team allows you to post differently. Um, you know, it's very easy to make money off of a brand. And so some teams are very strict um, how you post. And I, um, my team, like it's, you know, you just have to protect the brand. Like people will copyright and will use things and can, it's just, it's a very like sensitive area now. So I just, I do try and be very, 
particular, I'm very careful how I post now, just out of the respect for like the brand for the organization that I work for and making sure that I follow those rules that they set because it is just for safety reasons and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, that's a whole nother ball game, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I see no, I, I think the Livy Dunn is like an exceptional case. Like I, I'm sure like a lot of college athletes will now hop on that bandwagon wagon of making content while in college. But I see you've, you've got just as, if not an even bigger opportunity, you know, in the role that you're in. Sure, you might have less creativity over the content you make, but I don't know, try and do like dances with players or really go into the brand. And I, I don't see, I might be wrong in this because I'm uninformed, but I don't see any reason if you're promoting the brand, why that can't be part of your page. And then even more fans will want to follow you, et cetera, et cetera. And the snowball effect will sort of grow over time. So I hope you do continue with that because I'm sure, you know, even for the the NFL team, it's it's amazing coverage for them. Um, this is a, a sort of weird question to ask because you're so, you're still very young and you, although you've had like 15, 20 years, or whatever worth of experience in the dance sort of industry, you've still got a lot of life ahead of you. Um, but I wanted to ask, like, what do you want your legacy to be? Not just as a cheerleader, but like in your life, as you look forward and you're whatever, a hundred years old. How do you want Hannah Stutz to be remembered? I, you know, I love that saying that I want to leave the world a better place than I found it, or I want to leave everything that I'm involved in a better place than when I found it. And, you know, we, the world that we live in is kind of mad right now. I think, um, you know, you have to like, you have to just be so careful with like, you know, genuine people and like genuine things versus like fake things. And, and with social media, things are so like you are, I'm trying to figure out how I want to say this. I think how I want to leave my legacy is like, yes, like I love dance. I love being able to share my passion with others. I love being able to speak on it. But at the, at the end of the day, I just want to be just like a light and bring like love and like bring happiness into everything that I do. You know, I am, my faith means everything to me. And I just want to walk um, and like share um, and love people the way that like God does and be a, um, and be an example of him. And we're not perfect people. Like the world is not perfect. Like we were created that way. And it's not that I'm striving for perfection. I just want to be able to like reach as many people as I can and like help as many people as I can in whatever light that might be. But just like leaving a positive, loving impact just in every step of life that I enter to. And what what's next for you? Like following this year as a cheerleader, is the, you know, is your intent to keep going with a team or find another team or find another career path? What's what's your your what's next for you in the next five years? Yeah. So um you had mentioned, you know, you're you were like, I'm 20 and I'm in college and I have no idea what I'm doing. Harvey, neither do I. I, <laughs> I don't know if I ever will, to be honest. I I, you know, I am so bad about like, what's next? What's next? What's next? What am I going to do next? Blah, 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 blah. And I feel like that creates, you know, fair warning. You know, they say, like when I was in college, they were like, you, you better be careful. You're going to blink and it's going to be over. And I'm like, no, y'all are crazy. No, it won't. Okay. Well, it did. I blinked and four years flew by. Um, and they say like life moves twice as fast, like once you graduate and it like I can't believe I'm a year and like almost a year and a half out of college. Like that blows my mind. I feel like I literally was, you know, sitting in my dorm room yesterday. And so, um, for me, I'm still chasing that. You know, what do I want to do? As of now, you know, yes. For in the pros, you have to reach out every single year. Um, so as of now, I can so see myself. I don't think my dance journey is quite over yet. I still feel like there is people I can reach um, and things I can do and and dreams I can achieve still. Now, I mean, ask me again at the end, like maybe in like January or like March or April, um, February, 
that that might change. I I I don't you know anything can happen. Like that's the beauty is like you can wake up and you're you're something can fall in your lap and you like never had any plan of that. So yes, I think um I will still be on this dance journey and I think dance will always be a part of me. I might not necessarily be dancing, but I think I will still always have a tie to it in some um shape, way, or form. But yeah, I'm just kind of in that process now of like what do I really want to do outside of this? Like what um, is drawing me to like to do, you know, I love, I'm so happy I'm on this podcast. I think what you're doing is incredible. I think um, what, how this podcast came to be and what inspired you to do this is absolutely amazing. And like, I strive to be you one day because, you know, I love how, what you said, you're, you just want to inspire listeners to be the best version of themselves. So right now, Harvey, I'm aspiring to be you. Um <laughs> Um, that's, I, that's, that's my path that I'm on. And so I would love, I love people and I love, I'm like you, I love to interview people. I love to hear people's stories. Um, I would love to like cross over like my dance world and like my, my dance career and journey with like sharing people's stories, like outside of that. So that might be of something. So I'm trying to figure it out, but I think I'm still going to have dance as part of my life right now. So I'm, I'm honestly flattered and think it was very kind of you. Uh to talk about my podcast i mean we can happily switch roles if you want if you can get me a good wig i'm sure oh. i can become a cheerleader for the team uh, <laughs> I, some I got i got some extras <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure i don't know if I, I don't know if i have the prettiness i feel like i can get the i can get the dancing oh, under wraps please. but i don't know i feel like they're gonna shut me down straight away um, <laughs> yeah. but i've got uh, i ask every guest i interview uh this one question uh and the question is as follows what is one thing you would want a listener to take away from this podcast? Chase your dreams and don't let a no turn you away from what you want to do in life. You know, one no is closer to a yes. And I live by that saying that like God closes the door because he has bigger and better ones opening for you in the future. Um, and it also is like a protection. I feel like, um, closed doors or protection from things you don't necessarily were supposed to be with or supposed to do. And so um, just go chase your dreams, um, be the best version of yourself. Um, Honestly, I feel like I've learned so much about you, even in that, that little time that we spoke. And what I think is really inspiring, both for myself and for, I think, a lot of people listening, is they'll look at you as a, as a role model, as someone that's achieved what perfection looks like, whether it's looks wise or whether in dancing wise or becoming a cheerleader which i think for many people is their dream and especially what you said at the end there i think probably is what something that stands out to me the most and that even you don't have it all figured out i think we all live our lives thinking and looking at these amazing people as you mentioned what i tried to get through this podcast and listening to and learning from the world's best in the given fields is that this person is an nfl player this person is an actor this person is a singer and we identify them as being a singer, as being an NFL player, as being an actress or whatever, and thinking that's their personality, that's who they are. They're not going to change. They're amazing at that. They're born like that. When in reality, they're dealing with the exact same problems about what they look like, what they sound like. Am I good enough? You know, can I achieve these goals just as much as we are ourselves? And so that's something that really stuck out to me. I think you've also got this just like posit positivity and like radiance about you and how you attack things and go about things in life. I think your, your journey is really inspiring because I think to go from, you know, having this dream and having this passion at a young age to actually making it into your career and, you know, achieving the pinnacles of that success, I think is amazing. I'm particularly excited to see and what you continue to do through the cheerleading, cheerleading journey, but also through social media. I mean, I, I mentioned it before, but, you know, that's why I, one of the reasons I'm starting this podcast, like I still see social media as, as, the, as the future. It is pretty saturated, but I think what it's really good at is... is pointing you towards the right people. And I think if you keep having that, you know, positivity around you, great things will happen. So thanks so much, Hannah, for joining me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I'm so happy to be here.